Hello, this is Will Lucas. Reading my letters home from Vietnam has helped me put things in perspective. Aside from bone cancer, my meds are also destroying my muscles. My doctor told me to give up surfing. My body is giving me the same message. My condition is incurable, and I'm told I don't have long to live. So what do I have to lose? As I did during my tour, I am also keeping busy to avoid thoughts of mortality. My letters home clearly show that I was missing my family and friends, and I really missed surfing and playing music. Here I was, living in a hellhole, yet back in the state, life went on as usual. Although rudimentary, Dragon Mountain Base Camp, lovingly referred to as Titty Mountain, was taking shape. The workload was intense for everybody. In my case, I was working mostly at night and became sleep deprived. During September 1966, more troops from the 4th Infantry arrived, giving us some free time. I took photos with a box camera, played guitar, and rode home almost every day. Communication with family and friends was critical. On September 1st, I told my parents I'd be sending home at least $200 a month, keeping just enough to have money for R&R. I was hoping to surf in Hawaii. It was monsoon season and mud had become a huge disruption to our mission. Mail service was erratic and I missed my family. I got out and dug my foxhole deeper the other day. I don't know why, we'll only be here another couple of weeks. I have to drive my truck from here to Bamming Town. It's a pretty dangerous road, so say a little prayer that I make it through safely. Well, tonight I have to stay in my truck all night. Oh well, it won't hurt me. Last night I was lying in bed asleep. For a while. Anyway, in the middle of my sweet dreams, I was awakened by mortar fire, followed by machine gun fire. It sounded like Charlie was right in bed with me. What did I do? I did what any well-trained 4th Division soldier would do. I took immediate action. I pulled the covers over my head and hid until the noise stopped. Your son, the hero. In a letter postmarked September 8th, it was obvious that I preferred night shift. As I wrote, no one is standing over me telling me what to do. I asked them again to send me a Lafayette electronics catalog. I was determined to build a sound system to occupy my time between radio calls. This was really important at night. I explained to my parents my new rank as Spec 4, and instead of stripes like a corporal, we had a patch with an eagle. As I wrote, I'm not even going to bother to sew the thing on. I'll just pull off the PFC stripes and leave it like that. Hardly anyone wears their rank over here anyway. Not only did we get a radio operator in today, but we also got another radio mechanic. He has been in the Army about a year longer than me. I got word today from the first sergeant that we may not move to Bammy Town. That's fine with me because I hate the idea of having to dig new foxholes. Thought I'd be a little different tonight and write on yellow paper. It kind of reminds me of being in first grade. I'll never forget. I wet my pants when Tommy Wilson started laughing at me. The teacher got so mad at him for laughing, she made him clean it up. I go on shift at 6 p.m. and get off at 6 a.m. All I have to do is answer the radio once an hour to assure that the perimeter is secure. Nothing much going on today, although it is about the happiest day for me since I've been here. They finally let us stop wearing our gear and rifle around the base camp. It's great not having to wear all that junk to chow and everywhere else you go. I got to the PX for the first time today. All that it consists of is a tent with a whole bunch of candy and stuff. One thing they don't have is washcloths, so please try to remember to send me some. I bought some envelopes that weren't sealed, so I don't have to use so much wax. I guess you were kind of wondering why I was sealing my letters with wax. Well, the humidity is so bad that the envelopes seal themselves. I'm getting pretty used to this night shift now and like it. It's great to be able to have a little time to myself. Well, better get some letters off to some other people tonight. Side note. We bathed out of our helmets. Washcloths provided the only way to scrub yourself down. Eventually, we built a shower with two 55-gallon drums on top heated by whatever sunlight was available. Water had to be hand carried up a ladder to the supply drums. It's Sunday evening and I didn't get to Mass. As a matter of fact, I haven't been to Mass for about three weeks now. The first week I missed because they called the Mass off because the priest was giving the last rites to the two guys who killed themselves with a the mine. 
Last week I was working and the time for mass passed me by without me noticing. This week I walked all the way up there to find out the mass was canceled again. Well, we're definitely not moving out to Bambi Tau on the 20th. I hope we stay here, but it's doubtful. If you ever hear anything about where the 3rd Brigade of the 4th Division is moving, you'll know where I'm going. Our company supports the 3rd Brigade. Well, we got hit yesterday morning. A small group of villagers hit our south perimeter with small arms fire. It quieted down after a while, so they sent up some flares to light up the place. As soon as the flares went up, the villagers started firing again. I was in my truck and monitored the call when it came over the radio. But first I heard the gunfire and looked out of my truck and couldn't see anything. After a while, when we started firing, you could see the bullets firing because they were using tracer rounds. It all looked pretty cool to me because I wasn't involved. If I'd been down there, I'd probably still be cleaning out my drawers. A call just came over the radio to the CO. It seems that one of the guys on guard has caught malaria. They said he has a very high fever and is the chills. There are a lot of mosquitoes in this area. However, I've only been bitten once since I've got here. I received three letters from you tonight. One was dated the 7th, one the 8th, and one the 9th. I also received the Olson catalog. Thanks for thinking about me by sending it, but Olson doesn't have anything like Allied or Lafayette. You can find one of these catalogs in the drawer in my room. I just have to get myself a hobby to keep my mind occupied. One of the radio operators from D Company blew his mind today. Only 444 days left in Uncle Sam's little playpen. Some of the rules that the Army have are ridiculous. For instance, if you get caught with a loaded weapon anytime, even on guard duty, you receive an Article 15, which is a mild court-martial. Do you believe that? These poor guys sitting out there in their foxholes where the VC could come up and stick a grenade in their back pocket, and you're not allowed to have ammo in your weapon. I wrote about a mortar attack the previous week, and that I was going on patrols. Yesterday I got informed I had to spend the night on the hill, so I packed up my bags and made it. I was RTO, radio telephone operator, for our first lieutenant, executive officer. Anyway, last night I had a call for him to go check out some lights on the south side of the hill. He told me to go out and check out the lights. I went out and I didn't see a thing. Later on today, he noticed some little chink walking along the road. Nothing unusual other than he was wearing black pajamas. I called into the battalion and told them what we had spotted and it looked like he was taking pictures of our camp. In turn, they called Brigade. Brigade sent out a PC after him, but they could not find him. Battalion called us back and told us to get him if we could find him. The XO started to go. Then he said, no, Lucas, you go. I was glad to take the opportunity to see a little action for a change. We followed him with no problem. There were three of us, a sergeant, a driver, and myself. The driver took us back to the base camp as far as possible. Then I escorted him, carrying him most of the way, back to the PW camp with the sergeant ahead clearing the way. I felt like an idiot. People were taking my picture from every direction. I couldn't believe it. Every time I'd pick him up and carry him across the mud, he would say, Thank you. Finally got him to the PW. Side note. It's strange how certain memories play back in your head. I clearly remember leaving this man with a group of South Vietnamese soldiers in a small prison camp we had on base. They made me leave right away. As I was leaving, I turned around, and they were beating the man unmercifully. It was an overwhelming feeling knowing that I had actually had someone at gunpoint. It's a relief knowing that I never had to fire my weapon for real. It's 11 p.m., almost the 17th, getting short fast. If I had 90 days or left when I came home from here, I'd receive a discharge right from here. Too bad. I've got quite a few more than 90 days left when returning home. I wish they'd stop shooting the mortars over the roof of my truck. It gets kind of nerve-wracking after a while. Boy, it was good to get away from the base camp for a couple of days. I went up on the hill again today to get some radios that were left up there, but some infantry unit that is taking our place was still using them. I'm going up after them again tomorrow. I'm trying to teach one of my buddies how to play the guitar. 
me trying to teach him, who's going to teach me? If you happen to find any of my guitar picks lying around the house, I would appreciate it if you could send me a couple in the letters you send me. I missed my ride on the PC today, so I didn't get to pick up my radios. I'm starting to sound like a regular lifer. I better close this letter, because I keep falling asleep in the middle of the sentences. Side note. For several weeks, I supervised a troop of mountain yard women, indigenous mountain people, filling sandbags for the base camp. Every morning, I met them down at the work area where we had a fire to keep us warm. Just me and a dozen set of naked breasts. I'd like to say it was exciting, but these were no beauties. I didn't get into town today like I was hoping. I think I'll be able to go in tomorrow, though, since I'm off during the day. I heard a rumor that on October 12th, we're moving out of here, 20 miles north of Saigon. I forgot the name of the place, but there's a special forces camp there that is forever getting overrun. That ain't what I call fun. Side note, for some reason I got into cigar smoking. Beer was also plentiful. We had nickel night every third night when you could buy cans of beer for five cents. Obviously, we all stocked up every third night. By the end of my tour, I was starting my day with two or three warm beers. The rumor about moving to Benoit was a rumor after all. As it stands now, we're not going anywhere. This means we can unpack and settle down for a change. They told us not to get settled down too much because they could easily pull us out of here at a moment's notice. I hope we stay here. I got into town yesterday, but didn't get to see much because I was only in there for half an hour. What I saw wasn't very much. Pretty dirty living in the city. Kids, well, you know, they do it right in the street like it was nothing. It's no wonder that the disease rate is so high in this country. Most of the people are pretty dirty looking, except for a small few. I'm glad to hear that you finally got some rain, but too bad you had to have so much at once. I guess things got pretty messy. You'd never have it as bad as we have it over here, though. They don't need to close our roads when it rains because you can't get through them, not even with a boat. It's all mud, in some places about six foot deep. Side note, mud was a true handicap for our unit. Equipment could not be moved in and out of camp. We literally lost a jeep in the road. It sank like it was in quicksand. I got into town yesterday for about a half an hour. I stopped in the California bar and had a number 33 beer. Wasn't too bad if it hadn't been for these scaggy looking little girls coming up and trying to sell their grubby little bodies. Yuck. You walk along the streets and little kids who are barely old enough to talk come up to you and say, Hey G.I. or Hey buddy, you want Boom Boom? Got number one baby sign at home. It kind of turns your stomach in a way. These people would be lost without us, not because we're fighting the war for them, but because they're getting rich off of us. These GIs come over here and pay ridiculous prices for a little loving. Meanwhile, old Charlie is getting rich out of the deal. This war is screwed up. Side note, the California bar was quite an experience for this naive, innocent Catholic boy. The girls referred to me as Cherry Boy, at first that is. Here's how it worked. One girl sat in my lap and began sweet-talking me. Ah, you number one GI. You buy me play kuti? No, thank you. Ah, you number one GI. Cherry boy number one. You want boom boom upstairs? 300p? No, thank you. Oh, you know number one. You number 10 GI. Fuck you. My letter to my sister continued on. I had a problem with the guy who was supposed to relieve me in the mornings after my 12-hour night shift. He would not get up on his own. I kept warning him and at first used little love taps in an attempt to wake him. One morning he refused to get up and said, fuck you. I was fed up. I could have been a rat and reported him to one of my superiors but chose a different option. I lost it and beat the shit out of him in his own cot. He never had a chance. He knew he had it coming and never turned me in for fear of bringing attention to himself. Never had a problem with him after that. I'm listening to all kinds of good music. Reminds me of home, but keeps my mind occupied. I should be getting a pass tomorrow. I hope so. I want to look around, play coup a little, and see how these people live. 
and make my own decisions on whether or not we should be here. Got to get some sleep now. My fellow Americans, not long ago I received a letter from a woman in the Midwest. She wrote, Dear Mr. President, in my humble way I am writing to you about the crisis in Vietnam. I have a son who is now in Vietnam. My husband served in World War II. Our country was at war. But now, this time, it's just something that I don't understand. Why? I finally got a pass today, went into town with the intention of buying myself some junk, but didn't have much money. I had to buy my combo chief some junk and had fun. You give them about half what they ask for and it's usually a fair price. I got a letter and a package from Dennis tonight. He sent me some guitar strings. He said that his band, Nobody's Children, is doing real good. They cut a record on United Artists label, which the Beatles were originally on. And they have WWDC and WPGC pushing it. He says that they're really pulling in some money now. By the time I'm a guitar playing civilian, Dennis will be a crew cut of GI from the sounds of it. I don't think he's going back to school this year. That's about it for now. Side note, Dennis Boone was the lead singer in the band I left 10 months earlier. Jan Zukowski took my place on bass and Lee Travers became the lead guitarist. Mark Matoris continuing on drums. Poor, poor, pitiful me. Got the package tonight, thanks a lot. I already ate most of the food. Tried out my new mug too. I haven't had much sleep lately because of moving, but it will be well worth it just to get out of the truck. Right now we're working on a tape recorder and listening to the Beatles. Great. Not much more to say except thanks for caring. Not much happening in the way of fun lately, just work. As soon as we get set up, it should be easy living again. We got all the radios set up yesterday in the tent. It's a lot more comfortable than being in the truck. Only thing is, I've got to figure out a way to rig up a heater or something in the tent, as I just about froze last night. This is good pneumonia weather. It gets up to about 105 during the day now, and about 50 at night. It rained for the first time in a week. I think the monsoon season is about coming to an end. One of the companies from our battalion moved west to the Cambodian border today. They'll be moving all their gear there for four months. They'll be building a forward base camp there for the 2nd Brigade. They'll be doing most of their fighting right from there. I'm glad they didn't pick our company for this. It's not too safe over in that direction. I'm giving guitar lessons to three guys now. It's just about driving me crazy. All three of them playing at one time, all hitting sour notes. Wow. I think I'm going to keep this month's pay for R&R. Boy, do I hope I can get to Hawaii. I think it'd be worth wasting these two years to get there. I missed a couple of days writing this week. I'm sorry. Things have slacked off a little today. I got to go into town on pass today. Didn't buy anything because I didn't have any money. We get paid tomorrow. I'm going on a three-day R&R in-country also tomorrow. I'm going to Vung Tau. It's down near Saigon, on the coast even. They supply skis and surfboards and all kinds of good stuff. I'm all set up to go. I get relieved at midnight tonight so I can get a little rest before the trip. I bought a guitar from one of my buddies today. I sat in some little park in town and played. All kinds of little kids came over and sat down around me. Kind of cool in a way. That's about it for now. I'll write from the R&R &R Center. It's amazing to read these letters today. I'd become anesthetized towards death. Because I was tied to a radio, I had plenty of downtime between calls. I used this time to write. I was so fortunate that my mother kept these letters and gave them to me so many years later. Looking back, I know I benefited from the experience in many ways. My first full month in country was a humbling experience. While we had adequate drinking water, it tasted horrible from all the chemical treatments. But taking a shower was impossible. Conservation was important to me then and now. But during September, living conditions improved somewhat as the camp expanded. We were getting hot meals at base camp and only had to eat sea rations on routine missions. 
While living conditions improved, my innocence was quickly waning. I was losing my religion and already questioning our participation in the war. I could see that our presence was causing a negative effect on the local economy, and there was a huge culture clash, which for many reasons built hatred. Children were exploited, but only because there was a market for that sort of thing. Even today, we go about our lives oblivious to the horrors of war. We live in a bubble, at least I do. But reading these letters from 50 years ago is also bringing about some closure. This process is also helping me to deal with my medical issues. And just like in 1966, thoughts of family, friends, music, and surfing are giving me the drive to carry on. Do you roger that? Over.